thank you very much, uh, Richard, for uh, uh, a really, uh, I think, inspirational contribution. Uh, and the fact that it's good that uh, we have a certain amount of time because I think it's important in some of these uh, discussions that there's an opportunity for questions and input. Um, we do have a number of questions that come in on chat. Um, uh, oh, and I think I've just lost uh, my screen. If I hold on just a moment. Um, that's why I don't uh, touch things normally. Can you can you see me still? I can see you. I can see the chat as well. Oh, right. Good. Well, hang on. Oh, I'm back. Sorry. There we are. I'm part, I'm part of the slide rule generation, I'm afraid. So uh, I don't I don't press too many buttons when uh, when, when I'm on. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to ask for, for questions. Um, David, would you read up? Would you pick some of the questions that uh, come out? If someone wants to already ask a question, I'll take a couple of all questions first. If you put your hands up and then I'll take some from chat uh, uh, so people can ask their questions personally. So anyone who wants to ask a question, can you put your hand up? First one I see is actually Mark. Welcome, Mark Hooper. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Mick. And uh, thanks for that, Richard. <clears throat> that was really interesting. You mentioned um, in the start that Keane said, you know, whatever we can do, we can afford. And uh, elsewhere, you've challenged people in Scotland to say, you know, can you wait for England to catch up with this agenda? And given, you know, Mark Drakeford talked about the Constitutional Commission, I can see Mick smiling broadly at this one, the Constitutional Commission um, being set up within Wales. You know, can we wait for England to catch up on this agenda, given the pressing issues, climate emergency, nature emergency, inequality emergency, that's all around us? Well, um, I'm well known for supporting the cause of Scottish independence. I'm not a party politician. Um, that's by choice, deliberately. Um, I don't want to be a party politician. Um, I don't think I'd be a very good party politician. Um, I'm not good at towing the line. Um, and I will criticise where I think it appropriate. And I will praise where I think it appropriate as well, by the way. Because, I mean, you know, let, let's put this in context. I think Mark, I mean, I'm, he's not on the call now, so he isn't hearing this. But I think he's an absolute example of something that, you know, in Labour, who's doing a great job, as far as I can see. Um in Scotland, Labour is not doing a good job, um, and I'm not Keir Starmer's greatest fan. Um, and I'll be blunt about that, because at the moment, I don't see how he's breaking away from the neoliberal paradigm, which I think is going to be a constraint on the speech that he's going to make today on what his vision is. Um, and I've tweeted on that already this morning. Um, can can Wales break away? Look, um, I'm well aware of um, Plaid, and I know it's going through its own difficult moment right now, and I hope it works that out, because it sounds as though there's a serious issue for it to address. Um, and I think Mark offered an incredibly mature and sensible comment on that, um, that you know he's not going to walk away from the partnership agreement because there's an issue of concern. Um, and I think that's what we need to do. Could Wales be independent? Yes. Um, would it be easy? Not as easy for Scotland. Why? Because that border between Wales and England is a damn sight more complicated than the border between Scotland and England. Yeah, you know, there are only four roads over the border from Scotland to England and a couple of railway lines. And no one in Scotland, frankly, needs to come to England very often. Um, try, as I know, to get from South Wales to North Wales by train, and you're probably going to go through England. You know, it's just a matter of fact, and it's you know very annoying. Um, why was that railway line from Carmarthen to Aberystwyth ever shut? Um, and others. But they, they were. Um, so there are clear logistical problems with Welsh independence because of the divide, literally, the geographic divide between North and South. I'm not arguing about whether people are different in North and South Wales. Um, I know and have good friends in both. I tend to spend more time in North Wales than I do in South, but I know both. And look, that isn't the point. The point is creating the vision for it. And I think Wales is behind in that vision term. But if England refuses to change... I think politicians of all parties in Wales have to consider the possibility that maybe Welsh independence is going to be necessary to deliver what is necessary for the people of Wales, whose agendas, I mean, are, are so clearly so different uh, from those which dominate the English political agenda. 
unless the English political agenda changes. And it may, because at some point it may be appreciated that this Tufton Street, you know, Westminster Tufton Street orientated agenda, which has been so dominant and continues now to have such influence, even on Labour Party thinking, um, can be thrown out. I mean, I engage with Tefton Street quite often. I do um, discussions on Radio 2, not infrequently with Mark Littlewood, who's the director of the Institute of Economic Affairs, one of the key right wing thinkers on that agenda. Um, I call him Comrade um, Littlewood. He really doesn't like that. Um, it's just not his uh, chosen uh, title, I think. Um, but they are so intellectually bankrupt that at some point they have to realise this model really doesn't work. I don't say it because I'm politically posturing. I, market economics doesn't work. It makes some fundamentally false assumptions, which are theoretically, and I can do the maths to show you if you like, but I don't think you probably do. Um, they just cannot even work. It's not possible for a market economy to deliver ultimate well-being. To answer that question, which Mick said at the start, why do uh, why are the working class always poor? Because the system is rigged to guarantee that they are. And the assumptions within the system are guaranteed to rig that the working class will always be poor. If we want to change the balance of priorities in Wales, we need brave politicians, we need cooperative politicians. But at the end of the day, we need to have politicians who will keep in mind that if it isn't possible within the constraints that Westminster sets, and Westminster sets some horrible constraints inside the devolution agreements, which are fundamentally designed to make it look as though the devolved countries will fail, then they have to consider the possibility of leaving. Long answer, sorry. Well, listen, thank you, for, th thank you very much. I've got three uh, hands up. I've got, uh, and I'll take them in this order. Perhaps if I could ask each of the individuals to make their question, then we perhaps take them collectively, Richard. Do you think that would probably uh, maximise... I'll try. I'll, I'll note them down. Because there may be overlap. So I'm going to go, first of all, to Jim McKenzie, then to John Waters, and then to Christopher Hall. And we'll see how we are time-wise then. So, Jim, over to you, first of all. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you very much, Chair. With regard to the trade unions and workers' rights, we've always been campaigning for a 35-hour week which we're told could be unaffordable. Now we're campaigning, in fact, for a four-day working week, which we're always told is unaffordable. You know, with, with, with new technology and, and robots, etc., the people's working life has changed. That the benefits for workers to work the four-day week are immense educational opportunities, better health, and indeed, and indeed better, in fact, productivity. If you see a few words here, you know, just a to highlight the benefits of that, how we could indeed take it forward. Because everybody will say to us, oh, it's unaffordable, it's not the right time. They'll always they'll always have the they'll always have the, the indeed the the um, negative arguments for it. I'm just wondering how you can um, expand on that to see how that would be, you know, benefit, especially for people's health and education to get a more equal and fair society with people having that extra day of what the caring responsibilities Indeed, for children and elderly people. So there's a vast, there's a vast amount of benefits for a four-day working week. But the newspapers and the capitalist press will always say, you know, rubbish the idea. Just what, if you can say a few words to to support the idea, right. we'll be grateful. Thanks very much. I'll bring that in. Incidentally, we have been discussing that within the Senate and some very interesting debates. Over to you, John Waters. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, you're going to have to excuse me while I make some rather provocative assertions which I don't think are contentious, but they, they, they need, they, they, I need to say them to lead up to the question. As I see it, uh, the form of, well, uh, the limit of what can be afforded is what physically exists. But at the moment, we have a very crude form of uh, information-destructive money, which effectively removes information about externalizations of cost, which are drivers of environmental damage, social damage, and so on, we actually have no structure. We don't have appropriate measures. GDP is a completely inappropriate measure for uh, all practical purposes, as far as I can see. Uh, we don't have measures uh, that actually relate to the connectivity, the real connectivity of available resources to actual needs. We don't have informational systems which actually enable us to effectively prioritize the allocation of resources they would in a body, uh, in, in an organism. Uh, and it's it's a it's a it's a very 
it's a real problem. It's a, a, a economics as we've inherited it because of the crudeness of the past technology is just not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't reflect physical reality. It doesn't uh, reflect systemic reality. Uh, I'm sorry to be so negative about this, but I, I'm, I'm just, is there any chance that politicians are ever going to be in a position where they can wake up to reality? That I'm is, that, is that the question, John? Or that is the reality. That is the question because I don't okay. expect you to address the other yep. bit. Thank like you. And then one, one, one further one I'll take of just that, uh, again because I suspect the answers are going to overlap on these. Christopher Hall. Yep. Thank you, uh, Nick. And brilliant to listen to you, Richard. So um, opening up my mind as to the possibilities, which is what I wanted. Um, my question is about. This concept of growth that follows on from the last questioner. Can we continue down the road, because every party does it, of growth, growth, growth uh, for the economy? Or must, uh, and must we accept, must we surely not, uh, accept that there's finite resources on this planet? And therefore, we have to have another way of measuring and presenting the, the economy to the public. So I need help on that. Thank you. Well, over to you, Richard, and you've got. 10 minutes to uh, uh, to respond to all of that. <laughs> well, it would be nice to have a, a, a question from a woman as well, because um, we haven't had one so far. So I'm going to allow a little time for that as well. I hope there might be one. Uh, um, these are, in a sense... In a sense, these are related um, questions. I, I'm, I'm going to go to John, first of all. I actually agree with a great deal of your um, provocative comments, John. Um, you're right. I mean, the economy we have doesn't work. Um, somebody posted a pile of neoliberal diatribe on my blog this morning, and I said, you're not expecting me to comment on that. I, I spend my life challenging this nonsense. Um, and it is nonsense. Is there any chance of reality? Um, yes. I mean, we have had politicians who have sensed reality. Uh, Robert Kennedy in 1968 talked about the meaningless of GDP and said that it measures everything that we don't value and nothing that we do value. Um, uh, he got shot, um, which was a touch unfortunate. Um, I don't think it was just because of that. And yet he was so fundamentally challenging the economic paradigm of growth by doing so. He literally said nothing is of any value. I used to lecture. So I don't actually lecture anymore. I'm a pure research professor now, um, which is a shame in some ways because I love lecturing, but I hate marking. Um, every uh, single uh, university um, tutor will tell you exactly the same. I love seminars. I love lecturing. But, oh, God, a pile of 100 student essays of 3,000 words each is one of the yeah, nightmares of life. Um, but... Um, I've, when I was lecturing, I used to actually say, look, there's a very easy way to increase GDP. You simply tell every single person to get divorced. The lawyer's fees involved will be phenomenal. The fact that you will create vast quantities of misery is beside the point. GDP will grow absolutely enormously. Isn't that great? Or you crash um, an oil tanker onto the shore of Alaska, which is why Alaska's GDP grows so heavily at one point because of the Exxon Valdez. Um, you know, it's ludicrous that we measure the bad as well as the good. There aren't pluses and minuses. And it's time the government did actually learn that actually there are pluses and minuses and even did its accounting on a double entry basis because it doesn't. And so we do need to have that sense of reality. Is it possible? Yes, I think it is. Um, for example, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is something called sustainable cost accounting. Um, I was challenged to work out whether it was possible to put the cost of climate change on the balance sheet of companies so that they actually had to take it into account and deliver it. Um, and it took me about two hours to work out how to do that. Um, I went and had a coffee sitting down by the river near where I live, came back and thought, yeah, there's an easy answer to that. And most of my answers, by the way, are easy. As I've explained this morning, of just changing a few pension rules could release 100 billion quid, uh, which is quite a lot of money. Um, and this one was literally how to change the rules to actually put um, the impact of climate change onto government, uh, onto company accounts. Of course, the big firms don't like it. It's been ignored, even though the international accounting standards setters on this are well aware of the idea. But I'm persistent. I created something in 2003 called Country by Country Reporting, um, which was designed to cr crack open the, the use of tax havens by large companies. And that's now the law in over 70 countries around the world. So 
these things can happen. I do believe change is possible, but we have to have the underlying narratives of belief to get there. So I think your answer, John, is that. Jim, I hope wholly get your idea, and I'm going to relate it to a very large extent to, um, to Chris's. Um, I've been involved with the New Economics Foundation since its first ever meeting. It's now 40 odd years old. I think the first meeting was, in fact, 40 years ago. Um, it was called the Other Economics Summit then, um, which was run in parallel with whatever the G78 or whatever the number was at that time. Um, and it met in London um, at the LSE. Uh, and I was its first external accountant, but quite heavily involved for a while. And so I've known about economic thing, alternative economic thinking for a long time. And my point is that four day week is part of that agenda. And I know how important flexibility is. I you know, mentioned earlier the idea of shit jobs, and there are so many shit jobs. I mean, you know, the, the worst example being the people who have to sit answering a phone towards a, you know, an absolute time scale, only allowed to go to the loo when they put up their hands, not allowed to take breaks, everything else. These are awful working conditions designed to undermine people's health and well-being. And it is not the direction we need to be going in. We need to be finding ways for people to work which are much better than that. A four-day weeks, I actually believe in. I'm, I'm, I'm a bad exponent of the idea because, in fact, you'll notice I blog seven days a week. <laughs> um, but then... I take a very flexible approach to work. Um, I might start at soon after six in the morning, but I don't necessarily um, work all day. I'm a great believer in having a lunchtime nap. Um, I will probably have one today at some point. Um, I, I'm a great believer in going for a walk. I get my best ideas for going for a walk by going for a walk. Now, is that work or not? I once thanked somebody who gave me a grant for the opportunity to spend a great deal of time looking out of the window um, because that's what I did with the money. Um, that came up with some good ideas, including the joy of tax, I think, as a result. Now, the point is we need to actually balance well-being and the working week. And I think AI does let us do that, but only if we tax capital enough to redistribute the benefits of AI so that people need work less so they can undertake other activities more, including volunteering and participating in the community, caring and everything else, or just having leisure time. And I wrote an article about that in the last week, saying literally there is this enormous threat from AI, which means we have to rethink the whole of the basis of taxation. Because unless we redistribute the benefits of AI, we are going to see people actually worse off than they are now as a result of this terrible p potential outcome. But that's also linked to this idea of growth. Growth is meaningless. I mean, as you say, GDP, um, obviously linked to John's question here. Um, the idea that we must grow automatically is just obsessive. Um, again, one of the things I used to tell my students um, was that if you um, believed every economist chart, the best place in the world is in Middlesbrough because every uh, chart points to the northeast. Um, the line will always go upwards to the northeast. Um, and if it gets there, it's good. But you know, this is nonsense. Um, we know full well that there's a limit to our physical, personal needs. What there isn't a limit to, and this is actually the theme of my book, one of the themes of my book, The Courageous State. And it was actually challenging how we can actually balance growth with a more courageous government. And I said, we need to have better emotional well-being better intellectual well-being and better spiritual well-being to balance our material well-being. We actually over-consume material goods now. No, that's indisputable, I think. And yet we underinvest in our emotional family and friend relationships. We underinvest in our intellectual capacity. Many people do not get the trainings and opportunities they need. And we don't actually try to discover purpose. So I think all of those things are really fundamental. We need to rethink what the goal and what it is that we're trying to, well, not maximise even, but balance. And balance is more important than growth. And maximisation is a ghastly word we should consign to the economic bin. Can I ask you then one further question? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and um, from the chat line, I think this will probably be the last question we've got. I hope you don't see any other hands up, but I did want to uh, take up some of the questions from the chat line. It's actually uh, Sarah Longland's question to everyone, but I'll put it to you, Richard. How do we robustly challenge a Majesty's Treasury stranglehold of our economic policy, including control of some of the financial levers that you outlined? Uh, uh, that's the nightmare question. Somebody was going to ask a question that I didn't really know the answer to. And Sarah, thank you. Um, you've done it. 
Um, look, I have spent time in the Treasury, not of late. I've served on Treasury committees. Gordon, George Osborne asked me to serve on a uh, Treasury committee, and I did. Um, and you come up continually with what is called the Treasury view. The Treasury view was effectively formed in the 1930s, and this is that governments must be small, they must balance their books, they must lower their debt, all of which is utter nonsense. And we know it was because it gave us the Great Recession of the 1930s. But nonetheless, those people still believe it's true. I mean, absolutely absurd. They absolutely decimated, and I mean probably correctly in this sense, in terms of well-being, the well-being of communities in South Wales was most certainly one that suffered very badly, and I'm well aware of it. Um, so these people, and well, I used it at the Bank of England yesterday. I called them sadists. I had, had an article in the Daily Mirror yesterday, which um, called the Bank of England sadists, but they fit into the same sort of structure. They have no concern for well-being. The only way we will challenge them is if we have really competent politicians grounded in the ideas of social justice who will stand up and say we're going to make change. And one of the ways we can make change, and I propose it often, is to have a ministry of tax. Um, we actually take away some of the powers of the Treasury. We deliberately break up some of its powers. Uh, some of the ways is to bring people who are present have been deliberately politically moved out of accountability, like the Bank of England, a, a totally unaccountable body who basically do more to damage the economy now than anybody else. Because, by the way, inflation always goes away by itself. There is 500 years of data on inflation, and it always, when it peaks, like it did in 2022, always goes down within a year or so afterwards. Just as a matter of simple arithmetical fact, it reverts to what we call the mean. Um, so all this at the present point of time increase in interest rates is complete nonsense, but dogmatically driven. So first of all, we need better ideas. We need to promote those better ideas. We need to talk about them. We need to break the hegemony, as I will call it, of economics. There is an absolute domination of our economics departments at universities by the Treasury view. All the heterodox economists, that's people like me, are basically sidelined into other disciplines. So I'm a professor of accounting. Um, I spend more time doing economics than I do accounting. Um, I do do accounting, but I spend more time in economics. But we're not in account uh, economics departments. They won't have us. And we need to have a politician who's willing to stand up to them. I hate to tell you, right now, there are almost no politicians who are willing to stand up to the Treasury. Um, and Rachel Reeves is most certainly not. She's a product of the Bank of England. She doesn't understand anything but the Bank of England stroke Treasury view. And so I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm slightly despair on this point. Um, but one day it'll happen. And in, in, a, in a very strange way, I took some comfort, comfort from the result of um, the Greens in mid-Suffolk, which isn't that far from where I am. Um, political revolutions don't happen in mid-Suffolk, let me be honest with you. That's not really where you're going to look for it. Uh, although, actually, uh, the Peasants' Revolt did start just a little further north than um, uh, mid-Suffolk. But the Greens took control of the council because in deep Tory um, Shire England, they've had enough of austerity. Just suppose that we actually did have the type of cooperation that Mark's been talking about and pioneering. Um, which we heard about earlier on, across the political spectrum. So we actually were willing to work across some of the political divides to actually break the Treasury view for the benefit of people in this country. Then I think we can do that until we find that degree of cooperation, that willingness to actually turf out this view, then we're in trouble. And yeah, that's a potentially a contentious view, but I don't see that it's the uh, an answer that's going to come from any one political party, I think it's going to come from cooperation between people believe that there are better ways of being. Richard, thank you ever so much on that really fine, great question at the end, that final point. Perhaps with everyone on the online way we do it, just show our, uh, our thanks thank for that contribution. Thank you.